in 1985, you um, served the chair of the Houston Department from 88 to 93. Uh, Jay is a very distinguished scientist, he's a member of the National of Science, and he did a large number of awards. But I will mention uh, something which happened in 2008, 2009, where essentially, it's kind of a few months, he got the complete Lamis Montashimi Paris, the Rise of Frontiers in Biological Chemistry, the Max Planck Institute, and then he became a fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry. I spent a few months. So uh, last year, actually, Jay won a very large prize in chemistry, which is the American Chemical Society Award in Nobel of Chemistry. Um, I do have a little version tale about Jay. Um, it shows that he looks very debonair the way he looks now. In fact, he's in fact a really young person. And so the story is a complicated one. It starts a number of years ago when Jay visited his wife and he bought some at the hospital. And he saw his son actually playing with his bottle, playing measuring things. He said, aha. And he decided to name him J.T. Rose. And sure enough, J.T. Rose became a professor of chemistry at home. <laughs> and now the production of J.T. Rose is multiplied by two. Uh, the young J.T. is doing very well. And ensuring that J.T. Rose will be publishing for many years to come. I've extrapolated the uh, eyesight F factor there are 200 eventually, <laughs> unless there is a grandson named J.T. Brooks, which I don't. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so th thank you, Francois, for that very thought-provoking uh, introduction. And uh, it's, it's my great pleasure to have the opportunity to speak to um, a savvy audience that's not the usual Gordon Conference chemists. And in thinking what I would try to tell you about today, um, I thought I'd try to dwell somewhat on you know, what it is we think about in metals and biology, uh, how we think about those things, and why we think they're important, and uh, a little bit also about the perspective and some history. So um, first of all, the history. And I, let's begin at the beginning. And so I, I'm, I'm well aware of the fact that this historic hall has no periodic table. So we're going to have to create one. And you know, the way to create one is to have a supernova of a protostar and the light elements get fused into the heavy ones. And um, this is more or less the thread of a course I teach uh, called uh, Chemistry 544, which is actually cross-listed still with environmental sciences. Um, how did we get from there to here? And what has driven this uh, remarkable evolution and this remarkable construction of biology on Earth? And at what level of detail do we need to go in order to understand that? And I would contend that one needs to go to these fuzzy little things we call electrons. And if we don't know where the electrons are or what they're doing, I don't think we understand the process. And that's the view of a chemist. Now, I, I like to tell uh, introductory chemistry students um, in a forum like this, there are two rules of chemistry. So if I leave you with anything, it's these two rules. Now, Usually when I say that, the ballpoint pens start clicking. Right? <laughs> I haven't heard any clicks yet. But <clears throat> so the first rule of chemistry is that you know, all bonding, as we understand it, is electrostatic. There's no other force at work. Okay. And the second is that all chemical reaction is electrons flowing from where they are to where they aren't. And so if you understand where they are, and you understand where they'd like to go, then you have a good idea of how things work. And that's really the point of view that I'd like to leave you with. We need to know, at, the fundam at a fundamental level of the electron, how things work. So we start with this periodic table. Uh, we're all very 
familiar with it. In the abstract, I made reference to something you probably learned in high school, if not before, uh, about the biological elements, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur, the so-called schnapps elements. And I'm going to tell you in a way that these are really only the, the vesicles, the vessels in which things happen. Um, and to understand things like this, this is a, a scheme from a very nice science paper by uh, Paul Falkowski and his group, uh, trying to outline the flux of various elements and small molecules, water, carbon dioxide, ammonia, methane, hydrogen, oxygen. Um, this is very beautiful and insightful way of presenting this material because you can, you can group it into things that we know. Photosynthesis, the process of making oxygen from sunlight and water, and respiration, the process of burning up that oxygen and dumping electrons onto it to get that free energy back. But a scheme like this doesn't tell us an important thing. It doesn't tell us how these rules work in this context and doesn't tell us how these various uh, uh, fluxes are pushed. What are the pumps and what are the drivers and what are the driving forces and how do we measure them? How do we think about them? And this is what I'm going to try to leave you with today. So we redraw this periodic table with some focus on the transition metals in the middle here that uh, do various things. And here I try to outline what those things are. Some metals are Lewis acids. Some metals are involved in electron transfer. Um, group transfer reactions such as hydrolysis and uh, assembly of phosphate esters and things, redox, catalysis, I'm going to focus here. But living systems need also to store energy and sometimes they need to build hard objects like bones and teeth and shells. And many of these things are not done with the typical biological elements. So let's start with a very simple reaction and see if we can think about this a little bit. And I would contend on the global scale that we had better understand this reaction better than we do for the future of the planet. And we live in this water world that's surrounded by oxygen. And um, as you well know, uh, the chemists here, of course, will also re recognize this is not a balanced equation. Uh, there should be some electrons. So these fuzzy little things I left out of here. Nonetheless, this is the sort of thing that we want to understand. So let's write some balanced equations. This one. Basic, basically, in this direction, that's respiration, and in this direction, it's photosynthesis. Is that all you need to know? No, we need to break it down into pieces like this, various half reactions, the, the currency of electrons and protons. And so let's, let's try to understand that. But let's put it into some context. Those first two reactions, that's what we commonly call the hydrogen economy. Uh, there are various practical reasons why you'd like to think about a hydrogen economy. If you can make hydrogen and burn it to water, there's no carbon dioxide in the cycle, nothing to worry about. But there are huge technical problems with dealing with hydrogen gas. Um, these carbon-centric reactions are basically the, the carbon economy that we live in now that we worry so much about. How much CO2 there is, where it comes from, how can we drive some of these reactions backward to consume perhaps the carbon dioxide and make something useful uh, or make a cycle that makes no more. Um, and a third part of this Nitrogen fixation, which has been going on in biology for a long time, catalyzed by an iron sulfur cluster, which has a very peculiar carbon atom in the middle of it. Um, but also the Haber-Bosch process, also an iron catalyst, uh, which has produced uh, roughly half of the ammonia that's now in circulation and is in our bodies now as, proton as, as proteins. 
So let's start here. Let's see if we can understand something, and now I'm speaking broadly from the field of bioinorganic chemistry today. Um, here's hydrogenase. Now what's interesting about the crystal structure of this protein, uh, besides being a rather attractive picture, this is a really good example of a protein that is uh, a receptacle for chemical catalysis. Because these uh, orange and red globs here, these are iron sulfur clusters. One, two, three, four, five of them. And we now understand that the way this thing works, it gathers up electrons that hop from iron to iron to be fed into this central cluster to be combined with protons to make hydrogen. So this protein is there to hold these irons in just the right way, to adjust their redox potentials in just the right way so that this reaction can proceed with almost no barrier in both directions. Now if we zoom into the middle of that and look at this actosite cluster, uh, we see um, a remarkably complex iron sulfur containing species with a rather improbable carbon nitrogen carbon bridge between these two sulfurs. And people have been interested, this was only re realized re very recently that that's a nitrogen and it turns out to be absolutely essential. Um, how is it working? <clears throat> well, synthetic chemists have been able to build um, remarkably similar structures. Although sadly for the people who made this compound, they built it before they, it was realized that this was a nitrogen and not a carbon. Uh, needless to say, this molecule didn't work. So just building something that looks like the actosite of, of hydrogenase is not going to give you a hydrogenase. But I want to make a, another statement about, I, I love crystallography. It gives us lots of beautiful pictures to look at and we can try to stargaze those structures and imagine how a particular structure is going to work. But I, I think it is often very much like uh, trying to look at um, molecules all lined up in a crystal. And you can see this guy here is uh, trying to figure out how these birds fly. And well, the crystal structure is a bunch of molecules at rest. They're all lining up next to each other. They're all crystallographically oriented. That's why we get the electron, uh, the, uh, the diffraction data and the electron density map. So what we'd like to do is to take things to a stage of this. Right, can we see molecules doing what they do and how do we measure that? I love this picture because it does reveal a huge amount besides the way the wing and the tail is being used, but also notice the eye and the feet. And you can just imagine the trajectory of this molecular bird. So, um, two of my favorite people in science, uh, uh, Dan Dubois and, and, and Morris Bullock, uh, have, have thought about this hydrogenase problem and actually built a synthetic molecule, and this is their cartoon, which is really very nice because it, besides being fanciful, it's, it's actually chemically revealing and that the role of this nitrogen turns out to be to gather in a proton in order to protonate a, a hydride which resides on nitrogen. So you can imagine driving this catalyst and this simple molecule actually manages enzymatic-like turnover rates. So there's, there, there, is, there is hope for the future that we are going to be able to design small molecules, but it would not have been possible had we not understood the role of this nitrogen in supplying a proton to a metal hydride. Um, another one of my favorite people, Fraser Armstrong at Oxford, uh, took a, a, a nickel iron hydrogenase and attached it to a titanium dioxide nanoparticle and upon photolysis and putting an electron into the conduction band asking the question would the proton care where the electrons come from 
Does it have to come from some other protein in a complex matrix? The answer turns out to be no. So turning on the light pushed electrons down that chain, this hopping from iron to iron, going into the iron-nickel cluster, and sure enough, hydrogen comes out. Not very efficiently, but nonetheless, there's a good indication that such synthetic constructs could work. So that brings me to carbon. This is an area that we've been involved in for a very long time. Uh, and you know, for me professionally, since the beginning of time. Um, how does nature break strong carbon-hydrogen bonds? There are organisms at the bottom of the Black Sea that live on methane as their sole source of carbon. There's no light, there's no oxygen, and yet they're able to create biomass from methane. We'd like to know how that works. So at the beginning of this <coughs> um, trek, I would call it, I mean, this, I think, was a good uh, picture for the field. I, and I tell students today that it's always a good picture for a research project. If you can see to the other side, it's not a research project. And so we decided, we had an idea that, well, how, how, does, how does nature break CH bonds? We had an idea that maybe it makes uh, a high valent iron oxide. And we wrote this down a long time ago. I don't mind telling you that the, that the, that the uh, reviewers of the grants and the reviewers of the initial paper were not impressed. Um, but why did we write that down? And so some of you may remember from organic chemistry the, the very precise arrow pushing that organic chemists like to do. This is electrons flowing from where they are to where they aren't, taking lone pairs and pushing them out of protons. So we had this idea that maybe a reduced metal bound to a peroxide um, could break an OO bond to make a water molecule very stable, so getting a stable molecule at the same time producing a reactive intermediate. So in a way of keeping book here, the weak oxygen-oxygen bond of this peroxide is translated into two molecules, one of high energy and one of low energy. People were still not impressed until we actually went in the lab and made one. And this was the first one. We actually, it uh, doesn't matter what all this stuff is here, but we actually made an iron four oxide and showed that it was chemically reactive. Um, I like this picture because I actually drew it myself. This is long enough ago that there were no molecular graphics to speak of, only uh, um, India ink pens. And so each one of those little lines was drawn by, even that dot, is, this is, that's, that, that's our electron at this time. Um, now, that led to something called the First International Conference on Oxygen Activation in 1979, a long time ago. Um, so you might say that the field moved slowly. Uh, to use some of your terms, maybe glacially is good, or even tectonically. But we were led to this beautiful place uh, to talk about oxygen activation and how, how nature and how biology breaks CH bonds. And uh, I thought you might be interested to see a, uh, an animated movie that I made for that first meeting, because it was the first time I tried to put into uh, a visual context, what we had been talking about. Um, and with the help of the Media Center, we've updated the graphics, but this is the original, which has been converted to digital form. So here's a molecule of methane, and here's a catalytic iron that we imagined to be at the active site. And so, watch. Whoops. I have to go over here to make that happen. Um, oh. What did I do? All right, so methane is approaching the active site. This is 
Not as exciting as the basketball game last night, but <laughs> there's an electron about to reduce iron to iron 2 because just like hemoglobin and myoglobin, iron 2 is reactive toward molecular oxygen. Here it comes. We were at the University of Michigan at this time and we had to use their entire computing facility over the weekend in order to do this frame by frame using ORTEP with a mechanical camera taking pictures of a CRT screen. That's how this was made. So, so now we have this, this, this iron oxo compound and here comes this methane and there goes the CH bond. We're making a strong OH bond at the expense of a slightly weaker CH bond and we could only move one hydrogen at a time at that, at that time, here it goes and now, at, the, at this point that carbon is sitting out there, it's a radical and we show that it had time to twist around and tumble and lose stereochemistry for example and, and, but now the carbon is going to realize that there's an oxygen there and a strong OH bond can form and we've made methanol in 1979. There it goes. <laughs> so we fast forward and, and now this is more recent times and this is after I met Francois and after a, a wonderful thing that we had this uh, in, Center for Environmental Bioinorganic Chemistry. Rachel Austin is here and she was also one of the uh, original people working with me and us on this project. Uh, and this is a, a cover picture from a, a review we wrote. Now it turns out that many enzymes that are important to the environment uh, do exactly what I just showed you. It wasn't known at that time. It turns out that cytochrome oxidase and respiration does almost the same thing. And if we run the whole film backwards and replace an atom or two, we have photosynthesis as well. Metal oxo compounds do all of those things. Um, you know that this petroleum economy that we've been in causes <coughs> issues. Well, bacteria that produce these iron proteins uh, cleaned up this mess. Uh, Ed Stiefel, who was here on our faculty for a while, uh, was a main uh, uh, um, investigator at Exxon who uh, helped to realize that uh, biological engineering and feeding the organisms what they need uh, would, would lead to a cleanup of that. Now if we jump forward, today everyone's talking about fracking gas. Should we do it or not? Well, that train has left the station, I would say. We're doing it. Not in New York, but other places. Um, there's a lot more methane being released, and uh, part of this work was done here at Princeton um, than we thought. Uh, what should we do about it? Well, the, the, the chemical industry is not going to go away. Here it is. Um, and I'll call your attention to a couple of things. Uh, did you know that $100 billion a year of ethylene is produced? And Dow and Sasol and other uh, chemical giants are in the business now switching over from petroleum feedstocks to fracking gas because there's enough ethane in the fracking gas to crack it directly to make ethylene. So we better get used to this. Maybe there are better ways than that, than running plants at 800 degrees. And so the question becomes, how does nature manage uh, these small carbon molecules. Um, so several years ago, um, a German uh, biotechnologist named Martin Hofrichter called me up and said they had discovered some new proteins being excreted by fungi and would we be interested in collaborating with them to try to figure out what they are and what they do. What they do is remarkable because at ambient temperature and pressure they can do all of these things. They can oxidize naphthalene. They can oxidize hydrocarbons. They can oxidize toluene. And so we embarked on an uh, investigation of these so-called APO proteins. Turns out it's a heme iron protein. The first crystal structure of an APO was determined in, by Klaus Piontek in 2013. 
you can't quite see the iron, but it's sitting in there, and here's the sulfur. Uh, these dotted lines is remarkable. Uh, it's, a, it's a triad of nitrogen, hydrogen, NH bonds from the protein backbone, hydrogen bonding to that sulfur. The exact same sequence shows up in cytochrome P450 enzymes, which are the major proteins in, in our liver that are involved in drug metabolism, and every pharma uh, company needs to know what P450s do. So we characterize this, and one of the things that it does is bind CO in its reduced iron II form and reveals the presence of that thiolate even before the crystal structure by the appearance of this remarkably redshifted uh, so-called SORE band of the porphyrin at near 450 nanometers, which is where P450 gets its name. So how does this thing work, and how do we think about it? First, what does it do? Uh, these proteins are, are made in large amounts by these organisms and excreted into the litter in which they are growing. So these are agaric uh, filamentous fungi, and presumably what they need to do is take various terpenes or other materials that they find under the, under the trees and the forests where they're growing and oxidize them into things that they can take in and use as food. The strategy is to excrete these proteins outside. So these are remarkably robust. And so we think that they're, they're very good uh, candidates for uh, biocatalysts since they're designed to operate outside the cell. They don't need anything in the cell. All they need is hydrogen peroxide somehow to operate. Here, for example, a hydroxylation of ethyl benzene proceeds in 95% conversion and 99% in anti-americ excess. It makes a single stereoisomer there. With so little protein in the NMR tube, you can't see it. You just see product coming up and starting material going away. You can do lot. <coughs> Excuse me. You can do lots of other transformations. Uh, the ones that I find most amazing, however, is that ambient temperature and pressure. This protein is able to oxidize even the most unreactive hydrocarbons, even ethane. Remarkable. Makes one think, what else are these organisms doing out there? They may, in fact, be harvesting hydrocarbons that would be otherwise unavailable to other organisms by this process of being able to hydroxylate them. <clears throat> now, the, the crystal structure uh, shown here, here's the iron. This red funnel is... Um, <clears throat> a cavity that leads from the surface down to that iron so that molecules <coughs> can then diffuse to the active site. <coughs> and if we look down from the top, here's the iron we see a whole bunch of phenylalanines clustered around. So this heme iron is in a little puddle of benzene constructed by the enzyme in order to attract hydrophobic molecules into its bottom. Another amazing thing about the structure that we're just getting our heads around now is that the protein is packed with tyrosines. Now, what's we Interesting about tyrosine as an amino acid, it's the most easily oxidized, around 0.9 or 1 volt. And so that raises an interesting question. Why would you design a biocatalyst involving high valent iron to oxidize unreactive hydrocarbons and then surround it with amino acids that are much more easily oxidized? And they are poised at 10 angstroms, which means that's close enough for there to be a long-range electron transfer. It would seem that this protein is poised to snuff itself out. What we think uh, is that this is an escape hatch. If there is a substrate present when the iron goes through its cycle and reaches this high valent iron oxo form, everything is fine. The reaction occurs. And the iron quickly goes back to iron 3. 
if something is wrong and there's nothing there, then an electron can jump, reducing the iron back to the resting state. And you can see that there's even a, what you could call a pi way here of electrons could be, could be jumping uh, from outside the enzyme inside. So that, that's what we think now. <coughs> Let me tell you a little bit about uh, uh, an organism called Marasmius rotula, button mushroom. They're cute little guys. Um, we first obtained the APO protein from our, our, our collaborators um, and were rewarded with beautiful spectra of its reactive intermediate. And I'll just pop through here. We're actually able to see this oxo iron 4 compound bound to the stylate. Uh, also, it turns out, with an electron hole in this porphyrin ring, uh, porphyrin chemists know that this little bump here, around 700, is characteristic of a porphyrin cation radical. So we could actually look at this thing for seconds, as long as 15 seconds. And we could do kinetics and all the things that chemists like to do. I decided not to show you our kinetics today. Um, but the conclusion from all that, and coming back to the theme here, the bonds we make and the bonds we break, we were, we were able to actually think about how strong an OH bond is this when you construct a catalyst in a protein that looks like that. And is it strong enough, in fact, to break a carbon-hydrogen bond that we know is around 100 kcals per mole? And the short answer is, well, yes. I mean, here is this protein. We're able to determine that that OH bond is, in fact, north of 100 kilocalories per mole. That's precisely what the enzyme is doing. Now, this is a bit of a, of a fiction because it relies on a kinetic extrapolation to get a thermodynamic number. This is a so-called Evans-Polanyi uh, plot. And it's in a completely empirical plot that tells us that the rate constant for carbon-hydrogen bond cleavage is related to the strength of the OH bond that you're forming. Then the protein gave us a gift. Um, it's evolutionarily related to a family of proteins called haloperoxidases, who are able to oxidize bromide ion and chloride ion to hypochlorite and hypobromide, bleach. And so we could actually measure the rate of reaction of this intermediate with halides. And with those rate constants, we could get equilibrium constants. And from those, we could get voltages. And so we knew the electron, the, the redox potential. We could measure the, the redox potential with some certainty of that high valence species. Just how hot is it? And it's 1.12 volts. So it certainly is strong enough to oxidize a phenol. But this is a two electron redox potential. And without going through too much detail, we we're able to deconvolute this into a, a thermodynamic cycle, so-called Hess cycle, that has to be true, and end up concluding that the first redox potential has to be really quite high, 1.4 volts or so, and the second one only 0.8. Well, that's really remarkable. So if, if you're a protein that's in the business of breaking strong CH bonds, if you could tune that first redox potential up and sacrifice a little bit the second one, then you're doing the hard step with the high potential intermediate. And so we talked about that in this paper last year. Um, so we can step back and ask ourselves, well, okay, what is this little machine doing? And we can attempt to explain it on the basis of this uh, sort of, uh, this is so-called Bordwell equation, uh, where we measure the strength of this OH bond and show that it's equal to the redox potential and the pKa of this proton. That also has to be true. 
to some, but then it doesn't, what doesn't have to be true is that your reaction scheme could be wrong. And we're going to come back to that point in a, in a moment. So why sulfur? We now understand that sulfur is a thiolate. Electrons are being pushed into the oxo compound to make this oxygen more basic and increase that pKa. That strengthens the OH bond. But electron donation should decrease the redox potential. It's a balancing act. But apparently, the protein can le has been able to push electrons sufficiently uh, to gain more out of this pKa than it loses here. And we had a discussion with Emma Raven and her group at Leicester about this. They had a very nice paper in Science uh, a year and a half ago in which they were able to use <coughs> neutron diffraction to now start to look at not only the heavy atoms in a, a complicated protein, they were able to see also the protons. Still can't see the electrons. Interestingly enough, the proton here, which the textbooks told us shouldn't be there anymore, was still parked on that nitrogen. And that got us thinking about uh, this OO bond cleavage step that I told you about earlier. In fact, if you look at the crystal structure, there is a concatenation of water molecules. These water molecules are all lined up in such a way that a proton could be transferred uh, to this oxygen. We think that's very important. And so if you, if you think about it some more, you have to actually go back and re-derive the Bordwell equation. Because there are two protons, not only the one that's coming from the substrate whose CH bond you're trying to break, but also this proton that's coming in because you're making a water molecule at the same time. Um, and we and others hadn't considered this, but if you do that, it turns out an interesting factor of two shows up in the Bordwell equation. You get twice the bang for the buck from your pKa, and that's worth about six kcals per mole. It's a very subtle thing, but it's a huge difference when it comes to rate constant, six kcals per mole, like 10 to the fifth or something in, in rate constant, just for that slight adjustment. So that's where we are now with CH bond cleavage. And I, I, I want to f finish up with uh, talking about water oxidation. There's been a lot of discussion about modeling photosynthesis. Why would we want to do that? We'd like to build a, uh, a synthetic device that will take sun sunlight and make hydrogen. Uh, but in order to do that, you also have to have a substrate. You have to have water as your substrate. Uh, so how do you do that? How do you take water and make oxygen? Well, we know photosynthesis does that all the time. Um, what's happening there in these so-called light reactions is that electrons are extracted from water. Four electrons per oxygen molecule produced. And those electrons are used to reduce CO2. So that's running this reaction in this direction. Now I have to show this. We, uh, a lot of people are studying these days, how does the photon energy get into the place it needs then to do this water oxidation? And this is a so-called an antenna heme, uh, antenna uh, protein can, packed with chlorophylls. And what this does is absorb a photon and get in an excited state and then wait until the enzyme apparatus that is going to be oxidized um, needs that photon. What is that? It's this. This is photosystem two. Crystal structure has now been determined by two groups and it's totally amazing and also amazingly complex. Um, you see membrane-spanning helices and all kinds of stuff here. You see that 
all this stuff in here, there are chlorophylls, there are hemes, there are quinones, there's non-heme iron, all kinds of stuff. But the business end of this photosystem too, I would argue, is right in here, uh, the so-called oxygen evolving complex. This is where oxygen is formed, and it's formed at a cluster of four manganese atoms and one calcium. And this is what's going on there. Two waters go in, somehow. Four photons later, oxygen comes out, four protons, and importantly, four electrons. Or, if you will, two molecules of hydrogen. And you could run the planet on this if you could do this. So, uh, our perspective and the perspective in the field has been to look at the manganese and ask what is it doing and how does it do that. And uh, Tom Spiro is here today. We've been collaborating on manganese for many, many years. And he actually helped us observe the, the first uh, manganese 5 oxo compound. And, um, I'll tell you a little bit about where we are today, but first let's dive right into that active site and see how it's arranged. So three of the manganese and one calcium are in roughly a cube. And then there is this fourth manganese, the so-called dangler manganese, and a lot of attention has been, has been addressed to that manganese as perhaps being the hot one, the one that's doing the chemistry, the one that's now forming an OO bond instead of, instead of breaking it, which is just a microscopic reverse of that little arrow pushing exercise I showed you half an hour ago. Um, there's also a chloride ion sitting here. Actually, there are two. One is off stage left. Um, we have some ideas of what that chloride is doing. I won't get around to that today, but I did want to, what, what, what we did was to ask, what's the minimal structure that you could imagine that might allow one to see what is manganese doing? And our idea was, well, if, if it is this dangler manganese, and all of this stuff is involved in electron transfer, and perhaps also poising the redox potential of this manganese by the oxidation state of that, and also the electrostatics of the calcium, maybe we could do away with all of this and focus on one manganese if we had just the right ligand that poise the manganese in just the right. So, closing slide. I said that uh, nature has not put, in, put manganese into porphyrins yet, only iron. Nature also has a great difficulty managing fluoride. There is one fluorine processing enzyme known, and basically what it does is to bind a fluoride ion and induce it to behave as a nucleophile. Very basic chemistry. Why is there no fluorine redox chemistry? Is it because it doesn't exist or it's way out of range? Well, it turns out that's not the case and in recent years we've been able to, um, <coughs> to take that jump from what we knew and what we know about how to break CH bonds and hydroxylate that center to be able to instead to put fluorine in. Now, why would we want to do that? First, well, a, a large and growing fraction of all drugs and agrochemicals are fluorinated because they're metabolized more slowly. They cross the blood-brain barrier uh, better. They bind to their enzyme targets more tightly. Also, you can put fluorine 18 radioactive fluorine 18 with a half-life of about two hours in a molecule and use it to image, say, the brain. If you have a drug that binds to a particular enzyme and you're looking to see, for example, if COX-2 enzymes are expressed in the brain of a patient that uh, has a brain tumor, uh, that's how you do it. So we were able to do this. Um, I have to give a special credit to uh, Jungi, who's here in the audience, who, who actually conceived of this picture and uh, who defended his thesis on, on this topic recently. Unfortunately, I'm not going to have time to talk about it, but I think the, the, the point here is that um, studying these metalloproteins for their own sake has also led us to think about 
things that we would dream of doing and how we might do it. And it turns out that it works, sometimes. So let me close by, by thanking everybody who did the work and without them, there is nothing to talk about. And so um, this is a, a, a picture of the group from several years ago. Uh, some, this is a more recent picture of the group. I have to also call attention to uh, a cohort of very, very uh, talented undergraduates who have been through the lab in recent years and who have participated in this. And I thank you all for your attention. The answer is uh, yes. So it's a great question. And so um, the, the question is, can you, you know, to what extent is the protein um, manipulating the redox chemistry of the transition metal? Let me tell you an example, right? Bacteria make uh, um, two types of superoxide dismutase. This is, these are proteins that guard us against that uh, reduced form of oxygen that would burn us up. They make one containing manganese and they make one containing iron. A single iron and a single manganese. The two proteins, crystal structures, to my eye at least, are superimposable. And yet, if you take the iron out of the manganese protein, uh, out of the iron protein and put in manganese, it doesn't work. And if you put iron in the manganese protein, it doesn't work either. So the, the very, very subtle features in the protein, in fact, have tuned the redox potential, the manganese-2, manganese-3 redox potential, and the iron-2, iron-3 redox, redox potential to precisely the same point, which turns out to be midway between the redox potentials it has to have in order to do the dismutation of superoxide. So the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, the, the trouble is that we can't yet tell by inspection what those features are. They're very subtle. So, several slides. You have your energies in kilocalories. Oh, yes. Is that acceptable? It is for me. <laughs> <laughs> and I, 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 I give you permission to continue to use them as well. I, yeah, I can multiply by four. So the journals accept that? Oh, yes. In chemistry journals definitely do still accept kilocalories. One of the, one of the reasons for that is, I mean, it's, it's sort of like the centigrade scale, you know, we, 100 degrees is boiling water, right? So 100 kilocalories is the strength of a CH bond. Everybody likes that. You know, 427, that, that's not, you know, right? Substrate, but in fact, there be a function there. Effectively, you do an electron transfer reaction, and something. Oh, yeah, so all right. So yeah. So I mean, is there is there a functional reason to have this halo of of uh, tyrosines around a redox enzyme? And I mean, it sounds wasteful. It sounds wasteful, right? Except you, well, you have, except you have to balance that. How many, how many molecules do you want to, useful molecules do you want to make before you kill your enzyme? I think it's that calculation. After all, the organism has gone to the trouble of assembling this protein and making the heme and putting it in there, and then it sends this protein out into the wilderness, never to be seen again, hoping it's going to make enough food. So it has to make enough of those. It's the, it's the siderophore problem all over again. It has to make enough of those in order to do something. So each enzyme has to last long enough to make enough food molecules that it's worth it. All right, so that would be, um, um, 
That would be a reason to arm this protein that you're putting out into the world uh, with uh, functions that would allow it to live long. Oh, yeah, so, so the, we'd like to think so. Um, nitrogenase, I mean, it, it's actually a very, uh, you know, we discussed this in Washington when we just are trying to determine how much money should we throw at uh, nitrogenase research, right? Uh, Haber-Bosch process is pretty good, uh, although the plants are huge and expensive. Um, and we know, for example, that you know, the, the, the trouble with Haber-Bosch is that the catalyst actually gets nitrides on the surface of the iron and the difficult step is burning that off. On the other hand, if you look at nitrogenase, it consumes you know, a huge number of ATPs for each cycle. And so um, the, 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 what looks like wasted energy, it's, it's using ATP to pump electrons to high potential so that it can re reduce the iron low enough. So what seems to happen is you have to make a dihydride and the, then a hydrogen molecule escapes from that dihydride, leaving exactly the thing you need for the nitrogen to bind. And that seems to be very ATP expensive. So uh, nobody ever, I, I don't think, that we would have a, a, you know, a useful industrial catalyst based on that because you, you have this huge background cost of pumping ATP around. Um, so I, I, um, my guess is that what people are going to do is make Haber-Bosch catalysts better by making them not get tied up as a nitride and not go the other way. Um, but keep in mind, both, both so solutions are using iron, right? And Jeff, are you claiming that there are other possible solutions that are kilojoules from all of them to fix in the upper wash that there is in nature for that question? So my industrial friends tell me that as bad as we think, you know, 500 degrees C is, uh, the engineers don't think that's so bad. Once you get it hot, uh, if your insulation is good, and particularly if your reaction is exothermic, you just let the reaction keep your, 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 your vessel hot. Right, so uh, sometimes our notions of, you know, that they're, you know, uh, although that said, the Haber-Bosch process is one to three percent of the world's energy economy. Yeah, so people are, people are busy doing that, and, and uh, as I mentioned, a nickel compound has been made that does have the nitrogen bridge in place, and that works, that's currently the world record. It's not iron yet. Uh, I guess the attractiveness of the nickel case is there's only one nickel, <laughs> and there's not this complicated cluster, right? So you'd like to do something simple, uh, in the words of George Whitesides, uh, I do like that part of his TED talk, by the way, and that is, you know, the importance of s simplicity. M much of what, you know, academic chemists do is too complicated to put into place on a, on a, on a vast scale, but it really wasn't designed for that. It was designed to give us in insights and understanding. Um, so that's a kind of roundabout answer to your question. Danny. I'm not, I'm not quite sure how to frame this question, but I, I often think that chemists are looking to, when they imagine the evolution of these uh, uh, redox reactions within biochemical systems, 
they're, they're imagining that they evolved from spontaneous redox reactions that occurred in the environment at times in the past. And I, there, there are going to be exceptions to that, but that seems the acquisition of those strategies seems like one, you know, the reactions seems to be one way forward. And here you have iron four forming. And so I'm asking myself, um, is there any plausible sort of environmental chemistry where iron four is uh, playing a role in reactions outside of these biochemistry, you know, from which biochemistry saw this, identified it, and started using it as a strategy? <coughs> So I got one, one, one way of answering that question would be to ask the following. What's the simplest system that a, that a chemist can come up with to make an iron four? And is that simple system something that might be encountered in the environment? So um, hydrogen peroxide plus aqu a aqueous ferrous ion generates iron four in water above pH about three. Low pH, it apparently does, it makes hydroxyl radicals. But above pH 3, it, and this has been shown, and you can actually isolate and characterize the, the ferial species. That was done long after, though. It, I mean, people had to go look for it, right? And there it was. So, so um, it does appear <coughs> that any place you have reduced iron and hydrogen peroxide, you could get iron 4 without proteins. Um, and at physiological pH. So I would vote for that being a prebiotic reaction, but one which requires, probably requires oxygen or peroxides. But if you follow the idea, then what about the very high oxygen state of manganese in the oxygen of the center, in the center of the synthesis then? That's really hard. Yeah, so I mean, people argue, so actually the the, the oxidation states of manganese over time keeps rising because uh, people didn't realize to what extent the manganese center is being reduced by the photoelectrons of the techniques that are used to get the x-ray structures. And so um, it's, it's now, you know, at least all manganese 4. And maybe the fourth one is manganese 5. That's the current. It's way up there. Um, now, what, of course, what's driving that are these photons, and each photon is generating a phenoxy radical, and each phenoxy radical is abstracting a hydrogen atom from a water that's on the, that, that's the way that manganese gets oxidized. So <clears throat> you have to ask, well, okay, do you need to have the whole system before that could happen? I would say you, maybe you only need, uh, phenoxy radicals and aqueous, uh, aqueous manganese, at least. It's a bit like evolving the eye. Hmm? It's a bit like the evolution of the eye. Yeah, yeah, so, I mean, ha but, 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 but certainly, I mean, these iron sulfur clusters that I mentioned in hydrogenase, and Dick Coleman Harvard made a career out of this, these clusters self-assemble. So if you, you know, it's, it's, it's dump and stir chemistry uh, which he did very elegantly, right? But you dump and stir just the right way, you get four irons and four sulfurs in a cube. And you do it another way, you get two irons and two sulfurs, and they're precisely the same. So those have probably bit, been around since there were hot vents in the ocean. And so it's probably not a surprise to find them in these very ancient, uh, primitive hydrogenase proteins. Thank you, Jim. Thank you.